You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 18, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Bill Powers, author of New Slow City, Living Simply in the World's Fastest City, in which he chronicles his journey with his wife to live simply and slowly in a 350-square-foot micro-apartment in Greenwich Village in New York City after being burned out from spending years of doing development and conservation work around the world. We're extremely pleased to welcome Bill Powers to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. On today's episode of the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, I'll be speaking with William Powers about how he and his wife got rid of most of their stuff and lived in a 350-square-foot micro-apartment in New York City for a year to practice slow living. I'm not going to suggest that you take as big a step as William Powers did, but there are some much less radical things you can do to help declutter and simplify your digital lives. Take a look at your smartphone, open it up, go to the home screen, scroll through all of the different screens and ask yourself, how many of these apps do I actually use? (laughs) <laughs> and think of all of those apps as clutter on your desk or around your room. They're things you probably look at every day and never use. Ask yourself, how much of your mental energy do you use looking at those icons? And even if you don't ever use those apps, how much of a drain is it on you to just be scrolling through them? And then, of course, I'm sure there's times when you tap on an icon that you don't really need to and get sucked into social media or watching videos or something else that you never intended to do. So one tip for today is to spend a little bit of time, even a few minutes, going through your phone and being brutally honest with yourself about what apps you really need and deleting all the ones that you don't need. You'd be amazed at how much you can get rid of. And then when you go back to use your phone and don't see all of those useless apps staring at you, ask yourself, does that help you to feel a little bit more relaxed? A related step I'd suggest you take is to ask yourself, what really, honestly, are the most critical apps that you really need to use? And then as the flip side to that, what are the worst time-wasting apps for you? And then take two steps. Take the critical apps that you really need to use, either for work or for your personal life, and move them to the home screen of your phone and take all the other non-critical apps and move them off to the second or third screen of your phone somewhere else other than the home screen. As a result, when you look at the home screen from then on, you'll only see the apps you really need, and you won't be either distracted by or tempted to use anything else. Then, and this is as important if not more important, take those time-wasting apps and hide them. Take them and put them on the last screen of your phone. Put them inside a folder. Put them somewhere that will make it take some effort to open them. And again, I think you'll then find you'll be amazed. If you put some distance, create some friction between that thought of using Facebook or something else that's a big time waster, and being able to actually launch it, you'll give yourself the opportunity to make a decision to change your mind and not launch it. If you have to swipe through a few screens, go into a folder before you open a time waster, you may just find that you wake up and stop yourself. Whereas if those apps are sitting right on your home screen, you'll be all that much more likely to use them when you don't really need to, and to use them more frequently and longer than you do. So again, 
if these feel like a big thing to do, this type of digital decluttering, just listen to what William Powers <laughs> went through for a year. And uh, maybe you'll feel that digital decluttering is not quite as onerous a step as getting rid of almost all of your stuff and living in a tiny apartment for a year like you're just about to hear William Powers did. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Hi, Bill, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Great to be here, Robert. I'd like to start by talking about your book, New Slow City. And I want to start with reading just a couple of sentences right from the introduction to the book. Here's what you said. This book originated with a somewhat angry question. It came from a reader of 12 by 12, a one-room cabin off the grid and beyond the American dream, my previous book about living in a 12-foot by 12-foot off-grid cabin in North Carolina. Quote, it's easy, she wrote, to find minimalism, joy, connection to nature, and abundant time in a shack in the woods. But how the hell are the rest of us supposed to stay sane in our busy modern lives. And maybe we can use that to kick off to the adventure that was the, the basis for New Slow City. Maybe you could either answer that question from the reader or tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, trying to live more slowly in New York. Yes, indeed. That's what had happened. I'd lived for um, a while in a 12 foot by 12 foot cabin off grid in North Carolina near Chapel Hill. It was an unexpected experience. I've been living in New York City and met this very inspiring physician who had actually downsized and downscaled her life to this off-grid cabin, um, giving up her big salary, living more simply. She's been there for 10 years now, a very fascinating person. And so the book 12 by 12 that I wrote was about that experience of minimalism, the tiny house movements, living more simply, permaculture, and that related set of ideas. But of course, at the end of the season, living in this 12 by 12, I returned to my native New York. <laughs> and the question was how to practice some of those values in a normal, modern life. And that's where that question from one of the readers of 12 by 12 came from. I often think about it, I go on a meditation retreat in the woods somewhere. And, and just like your reader, I think sometimes, yeah, this is easy. What about... What about trying to have a meditation retreat in Times Square? <laughs> you know, that would be yeah. that would be a challenge. So, so I mean, you actually set out then to really intentionally try to live some of the same way, but in New York. Can you tell us a bit about what, exactly why you uh, decided to do that and how you went about starting to do it? Part of it was just realizing how overworked and overscheduled we've become and also how much time we spend taking care of having too much stuff and too many square feet so when it kind of reached a bit of a just crisis of just too much uh, in new york my wife and i decided to make a radical shift and we actually got rid of 80 percent of our belongings and downsized from our you know, pretty good sized townhouse in New York to a tiny micro apartment in Greenwich Village. And so that was 20% of the square feet that we had <laughs> originally. And yeah, so it's almost like two 12 by 12s put together in the city. And the experiment that we were doing was two things. One was to live a more minimalist lifestyle. And by the way, that apartment only took 12 minutes to clean. <laughs> That's the kind of like time saving thing. Yeah. And also how to work less. And those were the two twin things that we did. So I actually scaled back to, a, at first, a two-day work week to experiment with having five-day weekends. Let me just step back for a second, because I think many of us have had the experience of daydreaming about the idea of scaling back. And we say, wouldn't it be great to work less? Wouldn't it be great to have less stuff? And then 99% of us don't actually ever do it. <laughs> so do you have any insight into you know, why or how you were actually able to even make that initial leap into it? 
as we know from psychology, it's much easier to make incremental changes than it is to make big changes normally. People, so I, I, I often say to folks, why not at least dedicate 10, maybe 20% of your time to delving into the larger structural problems in society, um, into your own personal happiness, what are the real roots of it? And that's, I think, what we did, in a sense, was my wife and I, in some ways, just opening up that space for reading alternative stuff that doesn't just come across in the media automatically, for meditation practice, and also for watching kind of films that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily see anything that's going to kind of open your mind and push you a little bit to taking that step. And the other thing was connecting with people who are innovating on the cutting edge of the slow food, slow travel, and permaculture, rooftop farming, all of these movements that are happening now, that you, they're, they're subcultures. But once you seek out and go to a couple of lectures and begin to open your mind to all the possibilities, you realize that there's an entire small universe around this set of ideas. So I think it doesn't have to be just that you suddenly do what we did. And in fact, it wasn't sudden at all. It was a mm -hmm. process over several years that led to that moment. That's interesting. So you really did spend some time preparing yourself, maybe psychologically, for what would be to come and, and connecting yourself with other people who maybe were living in the same or similar ways. I think so. And it is kind of an effort because we always tend towards habituating to whatever we're already doing on a daily basis. And oftentimes what we're served up in mainstream culture are, you know, um, books, you know, um, films, news and so forth that is affirming the dominant paradigm, which according to our system of looking at the world, it's not a sustainable paradigm. Of course, if you look at what the IPCC says about the rate of climate change at this point being a thousand times above the normal baseline. So it's just completely out of control. If you look at the other factors like deforestation, biodiversity loss, and so forth, a, there was a recent study of the nine major sort of living systems, like the support systems that are um, undermining the health of the planet are, are falling apart. And we still continue with the basic ideology, which is growth at any cost, which as we know, it's the ideology of the cancer cell. You just keep growing and growing and growing without um, any limits. Um, I think just introducing ourselves to a lot of those people on, on that other edge, what we sometimes call the creative edge, um, it, it's leading to another culture. And, you know, by jumping into it then a little more radically in the sense of really downscaling and freeing up our time, um, it actually was an even faster process for us. Hmm. So you, it sounds like you felt like you weren't alone in this or just you and your wife together alone because by the time you made the physical move, you had been joining together with people and feeling like you were part of some kind of broader community or movement. That's right. Yeah. And I'm sure though, and I remember from the book, it still was challenging in some ways to do things like get rid of so much stuff. <laughs> I'm sure people can relate to. Can you talk a little bit about what it felt like and maybe what was challenging about actually going through with that initial transition to the smaller space and the less stuff? Well, for example, my wife had four or five paintings by her grandfather, who was a well-known artist at the time. And how do we get down to just one painting, you know, and <laughs> what do we do with those? And she ended up having to select just one because we only had really room on the walls for one painting. And um, also kitchen counter space. We only had, I think, seven inches of <laughs> space in this micro apartment. So I remember her once trying to cut carrots on the cutting board and just slicing into her finger and cursing, you know, the, uh, the mayor's micro apartment initiative uh, out loud. <laughs> The other thing was, you know, trying to get into the bathtub, which was only two and a half feet long, I believe. And you had to adapt the yoga position shoulder stand to get yourself into this bathtub. <laughs> <sighs> did, did, did you, I mean, jumping ahead a little bit, was there a point at which that turned from frustration to feeling normal in some way? 
there was a moment at which we began to realize that living in a city like New York or whatever city you live in can also mean more than the apartment that you're in. So I think at a certain point, we realized that the city around us was part of our living room and our dining room and our kitchen and so forth. And there are all these public spaces. And we began to discover what we call urban sanctuaries, like you know Washington Square Park or the Rambles in Central Park. We also love Pier 45 in the West Village, where you can just go out to the end of this beautiful pier and you can't even hear the West Side Highway sound. We also realized that the roof of our apartment building, which wasn't really a roof deck at all, but it was a space that in the entire year of living in this tiny apartment, we never saw anyone else up on the roof. Mm -hmm. And we spent so many picnics up there and watching sunsets. We watched some baby doves fledge on the tree in our courtyard from the roof. And so the roof became an extension of our apartment as well. So I think that you know, some of that simplifying around you actually ironically opens you up to the world around you. It was like Thomas Merton made the point of the, you know, the, the four walls of his new freedom. I think we found some of that, this, this incredible new freedom from having less. Yeah, I know you talked also about just interacting more with people out in public in a way that you may not have done before. Yeah, well, it was partially the limitations of the apartments that caused us to interact more with people and also the fact that we'd freed up more time in our schedules, both things. And for example, the guy selling fish, uh, delivering it to the restaurant across the street each morning, just interacting with him, talking to him about the fish that they'd caught that morning. It was probably the first that anyone had ever actually stopped to look at what he was doing and look him in the eyes and connect to him. And that definitely enriched my day, um, connecting for one thing to nature because those fish were caught in the Atlantic Ocean and so forth. And also connecting to this human being who you just see going by every day and just assume is part of this big economic uh, machine that's just delivering something. Um, the other would be the jam in Washington Square Park is these musicians that's just come very, very good musicians. And you can go anytime during the warm months and just hanging out with them for a couple hours, listening to the music. I'm not much of a musician myself, but just connecting to them. And one guy said to me that he works 24 seven in the gym. I, I said, what do you mean you work 24 seven? I've seen you here playing almost every day. He said, well, I work uh, 24 hours a week, seven months a year. I said, oh, that's the new 24 seven. Okay. <laughs> and I know that you did talk about I mean, pretty extensively in the book, I think a question that many people would have, which is how did you actually scale down the amount of time you worked? It's another thing where people might think, wow, I'd love to do it. I just can't. I need to earn a living. I can't scale back that much for financial reasons. So particularly in, in a place like New York City that has a really high cost of living. So could you talk a little bit about how you made that possible for a year? Well, that's a long-term strategy and another approach to finances, really. And it went back to in my own life, learning, I think, from my father about how to save and kind of pay yourself first before you pay any other bills, set aside 10 to 20% in a savings account or in some kind of investment that builds up over time. So it's like an ethic that you teach to the next generation about how to steward resources instead of constantly spending. The other one is looking at, um, well, it's related to the first point, but are you investing? Are you thinking about the long-term investing in um, mutual funds, in preferably socially responsible ones, in real estate, whatever that you can do so that over time you'll actually gain what's called um, financial independence or FI in my friend Vicki Robin's book, Your Money or Your Life. And actually Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez, who wrote that wonderful book, showed how if you just also look at your spending habits, in addition to the savings ethic, if you each month really track every single expense you're making in your life, and when you're just becoming mindful of that, you automatically eliminate the kind of superficial things that really aren't increasing your joy to stuff ratio, hmm. <laughs> essentially. So over time, what you find is you graph it out, and I did this, um, you know, your expenses are actually going down over time without really limiting your happiness or well-being and your income's going up because over time you're saving more and more and you're watching the interest accrue. And I think so being able to do that, go to a two-day work week was the product of many years of that kind of a approach to finances. I see. So you had spent some time and I assume that living in the 12 by 12 cabin 
uh, for a while had helped as well in this building up of some financial resources over time that could uh, support you somewhat in the time when you were working less. Right. And the other thing that you can do, and that's a longer term approach, but there's also shorter term things that you can do. For example, I like the 80-20 principle. Have you heard of that? Yes. Right. So you get 80% of your results out of just 20% of the effort you're making. And likewise, you squander something like 80% of your effort on just 20% of the results. And maybe that's not as mathematical, (laughs) you know, a formula, but the, the basic principle is, is valid. I found that I really identified sort of the work streams that were the most um, satisfying and maybe also the most lucrative and eliminated sort of the ones that were, were not the case. And I also used the Hodg- the Hodgkinson's law, which is that, you know, work expands to fill the amount of time you give it. And by limiting the amount of time you have for a specific test, let's just say I'm writing an article for a magazine and I say, okay, I have to finish this in two hours. So I set the clock and I'm going to do it in those two hours. So now by doing that, I've already 80, 20 my life and realized that that article is definitely worth doing. And now once I've 80, 20 it, now I've set this tight deadline on it. And by doing that as a general principle, you're becoming more efficient and effective. And then you're freeing up a lot of time. You know, also I think what led to be able to do this was limiting in technology. I know this show is about technology and mindfulness, and we can get into that because actually, as a side note, I believe that the technologies we have actually can free you up to have even more time if you use them as your tool and you're not their fool mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And so what we, we kind of did was we really set limits on technologies. And for example, you know, not using cell phones after a certain time of the day or on weekends or taking you know, technology sabbaticals and so forth, but also just, you know, not getting on every type of social media and getting involved in things that were outside of our kind of core interests. So you applied that 80-20 rule to your use of technology as well and just used it for what was really most important and valuable to you. Exactly. Yeah. I assume also that the uh, lower rent of that tiny apartment couldn't hurt. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. It's true. When you, you cut down on square feet, you also cut down on the rent. Yeah. And I think, I know you said it was like two 12 by 12 foot rooms, but just so people know, I believe it was a total of 350 square feet for two people. Yes, it was 340 square feet. So there were two main rooms. So when you walk in, there's like the living room, dining room, just it's a 12 by 12 box, basically, and with a fireplace. And then you go through a small kitchen just with minimal uh, appliances. And even like the spices were kind of magnetized to the refrigerator and so forth. And then you walk into a small sort of 12 by 12 bedroom. And actually a little bit smaller, more like 10 by 11. And then there's a tiny bathroom. So that's the entire apartment. And it certainly is quite tiny. And on the other hand, uh, it struck me that I know the living space in the U.S. Ha- on average has grown really significantly over the years, uh, and that what used to be considered a normal, comfortable size living space for a family is now often not considered to be big enough for a single person or two. Uh, I seem to remember that in the U.K., a typical house, maybe even for a family, might still be on the order of around 1100 square feet in the U.S. is closer to 1,800, 2,000 square feet and is sort of considered the minimum that people need. Uh, I don't know if you have any experience or or knowledge about that too. Well, it's just the way everything has scaled up in the U.S. over the last decades. So at almost every point, we've chosen sort of more convenience and in this case, space over more context or community. So like at each individual decision point, it made sense. Like, so it made sense to have a bigger TV or to have um, a larger bathroom with a hot tub or whatever, like, because each of those things increase your individual happiness. But unfortunately, the flip side of that is by expanding in every way, you're cutting yourself off to those connections with people outside. And that was my earlier point about the fact that when by moving into this tinier apartment, actually you have to find in public spaces and elsewhere, um, those things you don't have in your house, like a big screen TV, um, 
an exercise room, all of the things that we've just sort of brought from communal spaces into individual spaces. And I know you also talked about in some examples of these uh, urban oases, you know, lots of things that you could, you and your wife could do in New York that were fun or educational for free. Right. It's something like there's the um, there's a website I think it's called the Skint S K I N T that shows all the free things that are happening in New York on a given day and there's something like hundreds of <laughs> free things that you can do. You have everything from these amazing recitals at the Juilliard School to mm, the just around the block from us, there were openings every night in you know Soho and in Chelsea and the museums, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, particularly the third story Chinese decorative arts in little corners of the museum where hardly anyone ever goes. Um, all these places are there all the time. It is amazing because I'm originally from New York. I grew up in New York. And whenever I go back there now, my typical impression is just how expensive it is even to visit. Uh, you know, a, a, a food is expensive. Traveling is expensive. And, you know, going back to the book, it did remind me that, in fact, there is a lot that can be done for free. And uh, I may just not be opening my eyes to all of it. Right. Even the fact that New York City is nestled in an incredible bioregion, if you look at the Hudson River and the East River, and then the city's kind of turned its back on the beach, but actually you can just take a 45-minute subway ride from the village and you're out there in Rockaways, which is a gorgeous beach, and, you know, just day hikes, hiking all day, <laughs> you know, it's free, and enjoying body surfing and you know, there's um, reverse commuting, which we would do. Sometimes I would take one of the short line buses that was coming in with the, comput the commuters, take it back out towards Harriman State Park or Bear Mountain State Park, an hour away from the city and 60,000 acres of forest with hardly anyone in it. That's another principle that kind of came out of this slow year we did was counter cyclical living. So if everyone's kind of going one direction, well, guess what? Going the other direction, there's a lot more open space <laughs> there. <laughs> and by freeing up our time in some ways allowed us to kind of do some of that mm -hmm. counter-cyclical living. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like you're describing a life that, that sounds like it's very rich. I, I would think a lot of people uh, would have a fear going into something like this, that they're going to end up feeling uh, impoverished or that they're sacrificing uh, something or missing out in some way. I wonder if you if you had that fear and in the end, did you feel like that didn't pan out, uh, that you had as rich a life as you wanted to maybe in the face of or because of the ways in which you had scaled down? And, you know, on the other hand, were there ways in which you did find maybe you were lacking in things you had wanted or had before? And how did you deal with that kind of a struggle? You know, I would say in the end, very little did I really feel was lacking because when you're creating this kind of a, another subculture or joining other subcultures and more creative ways of approaching life, it just automatically enriches you because you're making the decision and the choice, you and your family, in this case, my wife. And I, so you know, what are you missing out on? I mean, you know, you're being the architect of of your life. And I know a lot of times we don't even realize it, how much that we're going along with conditioned responses. The fact that, you know, in the Anthropocene, this geological era that we're in that is being created by human beings, uh, specifically by a global capitalist model that's extremely um, damaging to life's living systems, to the to, to the planet itself and to ourselves. Um, you know, we don't realize that you can create these alternatives. And I don't know, I just feel like the, that what we found was just that very existential act of taking different paths is just um, enriching just in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like, for example, living at a slightly lower standard of living, you know, these are things that people are afraid of. And they're also, like you say, they have a fear of missing out and keeping up with everyone else and so forth. Um, 
I don't know. I think what happens is you just get used to this, that new way of living and you're not comparing yourself to, mm-hmm. to others in the same way that you would have been before. Instead, you're finding a new kind of a tribe around you of people who are, who have stepped out of that mainstream way of doing things and are thinking about things completely differently. I'm wondering, uh, did you uh, end up finding other people who had chosen this path uh, intentionally? I know some of the people you interact with may have fallen into it more uh, because of various circumstances. Did you end up finding more people who had taken the same path, by which I mean had consciously chosen, let's say, to scale down for similar reasons to the ones you and your wife had? Absolutely. For example, the transition movement globally, which is a movement toward more local sourcing of everything, um, less of a carbon impact, and living sort of more in community. So there are transition streets in New York. Um, there's transition towns in 45 countries, 100 and um, over a thousand communities have done this. So just meeting these transition folks, you just could automatically get into those circles. Uh, the other were sort of rooftop organic farming and urban agriculture, those types of communities. Mm, there are so many examples of who you can connect with. Mm. I assume it, it was supportive just in the feeling of being part of something bigger. I wonder if on a on a more practical level, did you find that people were just able to share the the deep mundane details of how to live this way. <laughs> yes, definitely. I I think just I mean for us because we're also more into some political activism, you know, connecting with sort of 350.org um mm-hmm. a group working to, you know, limit the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so forth. So connecting with environmental um groups and and people who are doing things practically in their lives differently. Mm, also, we were part of a yoga center in New York, um, Golden Bridge Yoga, New York City, and just that little community as well of people who are you know, meditating on a regular basis and doing yoga and seeking out an alternative lifestyle, vegetarianism, and so forth. Um, you know, and between those two things and also just the kind of academic community, I was teaching at New York University at the time and just the students and teaching sustainable development. So the students are all clustering their activities around environmental issues and so forth. So, you know, by making that initial decision in terms of like your overall values, and we decided that, you know, our kind of value set had to do with um, finding, finding joy and happiness and connection in ways that are just very simple in a sense, you know? And, Mm -hmm, and then, mm -hmm. so by doing that, all the other pieces and the social activities and even the way we interact with our families and so forth. So we had certain limits, of course, on gifts, for example, in not giving fancy gifts um, at the holidays mm-hmm. or for birthdays and just communicating that to people that we don't really do that because we don't believe in it and so forth. So having those conversations also gives you a new dimension to your relationships with your family members. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I know that one uh, tra- set of trade-offs or struggle you dealt with that you talked about in the book was was that involving work versus time, if I could put it that way. You know, you did decide to scale back the amount of work, and then you had an either had or created a potential opportunity to work more, and you really thought hard about whether to do that and whether it was in line with this way of living you had taken on. Could you talk a little bit about that and what went through your your mind and your decision-making process personally and with your wife about it? Well, I think what happened was because I had the two-day work week as the kind of initial idea of 16 hours a week. And that turned out to be too little just in terms of how many stimulating things there are to do. And I think among the kind of cultural creatives, many of whom are your listeners who are thinking about these issues, like, um, you know, it's it's satisfying to work. And that's what I think a lot of us see. It's, it's something that's also brings a lot of enrichment and joy and of course income. And so by limiting, I mean, I found an entirely new set of pleasures and connections and relationships and ideas and so forth, but I felt the tug back into more paid work. And ironically, in the case of this living slow in New York type of an idea, what happened was 
by expanding into the free time, other opportunities came up. For example, there was a collective of artists who wanted to take my book 12 by 12 and make it into a, a sculptural, an interactive sculpture in, in Greenwich Village and the Queen's Botanical Garden and so forth. And that created this whole other work thing that I had to do, had to do in other <laughs> activities. And so what, what I really found in the end was that four-day work week was the perfect sweet spot. So it was 32 hours a week, still applying the 80-20 principle, the Hodgkinson's law of setting short deadlines, but I allowed it to expand to four days. And actually that was perfect because it wasn't going to that point where you're getting, you know, less um, efficiency per hour. You're still in that like sweet spot of really enjoying the work and so forth, but it's also not too little to the fact where you're just really just kind of having too much free time. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like you you did start out with this idea of two days, but then you paid attention to what was feeling satisfying to you and tried not to be too rigid about it. I think you mentioned in the book that you you did consider whether you might have an inclination to dive back into work out of more of a habit, you know, that many of us have to just work more, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that, you know, you you were deliberative about it and that when you made the decision you felt comfortable it wasn't merely out of out of habit but because it was something that would be part of the overall satisfying mix for you at that time absolutely robert it's based upon intentionality and i think that's really maybe one of the biggest thing that's come into our family culture out of all this is that everything's intentional <laughs> basically that mm -hmm. you're never letting uh, habitual activities or expectations slip into your true north. We kind of call it our true north, like what we said is kind of like, okay, this is our kind of vision. Um, and, you know, so yeah, if you're going to give up um, your precious time, and by the way, Henry David Thoreau said he wouldn't work using his mind um, towards the marketplace, only his physical labor, because the mind is a sacred space um, of freedom. And so I think I'm also very careful about how I use my mind towards any economic activities, because in a sense, you're selling it. Um, and it's, it's extremely, um, for us, just empowering to take that approach. Hmm. We fast forward a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, the book was focused on a period of about a year. And I think you had gone into it as somewhat of an experiment for a year. That year has passed. I wonder if you could talk about, you know, what's been going on with you since then and how have you carried on what you've learned and experienced into your life beyond that initial period? Right. Well, toward the end of the book, New Slow City, we actually, my wife had gotten pregnant and we were about to have a baby and we realized that living Spoiler in- Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spoiler alert. Um, you know, that we kind of realized that you know, in certain ways, like New York City is not the ideal place for us, at least, to be raising children. And for a long time, you know, we've been wanting to make a big step and do something different in life. And, you know, we decided to follow our dream, which was to go to South America and live in Bolivia. And that's actually where I'm talking to you right now from Bolivia, <laughs> where we live on, you know, five and a half acre permaculture farm um, in a beautiful town um, where the Andes meets the Amazon. And, you know, we just enjoy a lot of the same things that we developed even in New York in terms of, you know, work life balance, um, minimalism, and just how we eat, how we create community and so forth. I think we brought into this new context. Mm. And how long has it been now since the end of the book? It's actually been exactly four years. Wow. So you, you do feel like that experience is something you've been able to carry with you from then as a more uh, permanent or at least ongoing aspect of your, your life. Well, the whole trajectory from sort of living in the 12 by 12 house to the tiny apartments in New York City to coming here to Bolivia, you know, it's it's all part of a big kind of process and, um, absolutely. I mean, we, we carry out, I think the same exact values. I think the big difference for me is that just, I'm 
a lot happier when there's a lot more wild space and there's a big national park right next to our town and cloud dust. And so you know, just being closer to nature is extremely like for me, I just realized that nature deficit disorder, you know, and um, <laughs> the kind of um, biophilia hypothesis from E.O. Wilson that like we've developed as a species in this intricate connection to the rest of nature. And when you sever that, it's very hard to have true happiness because it's kind of like an animal outside of its habitat, to put it very simply. Mm. So, you know, in New York, you might say a lot of the New York, the New Slow City, like all those practices we were developing were in a way trying to get more of that biophilia, trying to connect to the river, to the to the parks, um, to escape New York, to the beaches and to the state parks and so forth. Like, so it was like this, it was finding a nice balance and, and it was nice, but I have to say it's a lot easier in a place like where we live now, or for those folks who are listening to this who live in more rural areas, um, just because it's so much more accessible and because the dominant capitalist ethos of work and spend, work and spend is not in your face all the time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could uh, conclude by uh, you sharing any thoughts you have for people who want to try to obtain some of the, the benefits of what you're talking about, uh, but perhaps who aren't able or ready to make some of the really big external life changes that you've made, who maybe you know aren't going to be moving into the small apartment. You have any suggestions for people for how they can capture some of that feeling of the slower life wherever they are now? Maybe the core or the basis of it all is this idea of, you know, what Gandhi called the still small voice within or what you call mindfulness um, and you know, present moment awareness, that basic concept of realizing that it's not about your mind and the way your mind's been conditioned, but rather about your body and your bodily perception of reality. Um, so in ecology, you know, we talk about that as biocentrism. So not being anthropocentric, which means, you know, everything's around human beings, but rather biocentric in the sense that like you're one of many species in a habitat. Mm -hmm. And then in Buddhism, you know, we talk about like sort of present moment awareness or the observer presence. It's the same thing. It's focusing on yourself as a breathing creature in a habitat with an unconditioned mind. So like that natural state of ourselves, both as mammals and as like people on a spiritual path and so forth is the key. And then from there, it doesn't really matter what you do in a certain way if you find that kind of freedom. Hmm. That's really great closing thought for us. Thanks so much, Bill, for taking the time to speak to me today. Thank you, Robert. It was great to be here. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, William Powers, author of New Slow City, Living Simply in the World's Fastest City. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair, author of The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age.